Hello, and welcome to another Meyer Sound webinar. How is the transmission? Am I audible? Am I visible? Excellent, loud and clear. That is very good to know. Uh, welcome, as I said, to another Meyer Sound webinar, uh, one of many by now. I hope that all of you are safe and secure and are doing well. Goes for your loved ones as well. Uh, today is going to be all about Compass. So without further ado, uh, let's get into it. Um, I'm going to share my um, share my screen and uh, let's do the uh, household notes uh, first. So um, Compass Go in a couple of minutes. But first, uh, for those that are new, um, we're using the Zoom video communication platform to conduct these webinars. And that means that in front of you, you are expected to have a screen not unlike the one you see right now. If you would like to know who else is joining you in today's call, you can click on the participants button in the bottom of the window, which will bring up a uh, new window on the right side, showing a list of all fellow attendees. We encourage you to ask questions by all means uh, during the call, but um, in order to do so uh, in an organized fashion, we prefer if you can use the raise hand feature. Notice that in the bottom right corner of this window, there's a gray button that says raise hand. And whenever you click that button, a blue hand icon pops up in the corner of my eye, informing me that you're about to ask a question. Now, in order to ask the question itself, we encourage you to make use of the chat feature. So if you click on the chat balloon icon, the right side window will split in half, bringing up a second window uh, showing the chat. There's a field at the bottom of that window where you can enter a message, which everyone will see, uh, address the nation as I like to joke, or if you happen to see a uh, fellow colleague or family member or friend among the participants, then you can also select that person and address him or her in private. Okay, um, that pretty much concludes the uh, Zoom household notes. And that means that for those that are joining us as we're simulcasting through the Facebook uh, user community group, um, for those that are joining us there, uh, welcome as well. Uh, this is the Meyer Sound user community where we're simulcasting these uh, <clears throat> webinars. And the group is growing at a steady pace. Currently, it has uh, over 8,800 members, which is a true delight. Welcome to you as well. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, as always, this is going to be another episode where we uh, discuss one of the, uh, the um, components of what is known as the tool set, which is our turnkey solution from design to uh, deployment. Today, we're going to go uh, look at Compass Go, which is uh, one of those hidden gems. It's truly, a, truly a miraculous app and incredibly powerful, uh, even in comparison to the mature Compass version that we discussed at great length uh, during previous webinars as we're about to discover. Um, and those webinars can all be found on our Thinking Sound YouTube channel. Um, these are the webinars that um, hopefully you've been watching up until now because many of the topics that we discussed during those four webinars will show up during today's Compass Go uh, webinar. And it's somewhat expected that by now you are uh, familiar with, um, with the solutions within our ecosystem. Um, so um, uh, should you have missed any of those webinars, uh, be sure to subscribe to our Thinking Sound YouTube channel where you can find these four videos dealing with Compass and, and many more um, dealing uh, with the tool set in general. Um, okay, Compass Go, an iPad app, an iOS app, mobile remote control software, allows you to do several things. Um, it allows you to adjust system delay, gain and mute, Manage product integration, LMBC, U-shaping and parametric EQ filters. See the current status of any parameters on a Galaxy or Callisto or Galileo and make real-time adjustments at the control points. Store and recall and manage snapshots. Um, make user-defined custom layouts, which is uh, very much simpler, uh, similar to control groups and control pages uh, to which we dedicated an entire uh, webinar. And then, uh, of course, uh, being an, uh, an iOS app, it allows you to move about freely and analyze array coverage and voice the system as you're walking the room, not being stuck to your office, uh, by which I mean your front of house position, not being stuck to your office, being able to walk the room and, and functionally have access to all the same features as you would expect of the mature Compass control software. Um, what do I need in order to work with Compass? I need um, a, a, a certain firmware depending on the Galaxy or Galileo device that I have. So if I'm working with Galileo Galaxy devices, 
uh, regardless whether it's 408 or 816 or 816 AS, then I need at least firmware version 2.1.0. Uh, these firmware versions are shipped with the Compass Control software. So if you download the latest Compass Control software, you automatically get the latest firmware uh, as well. For those that are still using Galileo Callistos, you need 3.12.0. And for those that use the original uh, Galileo, you also need 3.12.0 in order to make use of Compass Go. Uh, being an iOS app, it speaks for itself that if you want to download this, that you have to go to the App Store, which we'll look at in a second. Because here are the things that I'd like to discuss with you today. This is my little checklist. And um, as I already said, we're going to start by looking where can I download it. Well, that goes without saying. That is the App Store. Um, and then we're going to talk about views. Because in the Compass Control software, the mature version, which runs on our personal computers, we talk about a software which is top-based. Uh, surely by now you're somewhat familiar with our ecosystem and in Compass everything is arranged in tops. Whereas in uh, Compass Go, um, the tops have been replaced for so-called views. Um, and um, we're gonna discuss those. There are several ones. There's the home view, there's the overview view, uh, there's the IO view, EQ, matrix, and settings view, and then there is global controls which allow you to undo and redo certain things as well as manage your snapshots and access tools, depending on which view you're using. And finally, we're gonna look at how to manage those snapshots. And uh, we're gonna finish with a, a practical example of how to build custom layouts, which are very user-friendly user and even open up the path for non-audio professionals to operate Galileo devices. Uh, such as people working in the service industry, um, people that own restaurants or bars or hotels can operate Galaxy or Callisto or Galileo devices with cleverly built, managed, um, uh, user-defined custom layouts, as we're about to discover. So, where do I download it? As I said, I downloaded it you know, from the App Store. However, if you search Compass Go on the App Store, you will run into two versions. And that requires a little bit of explanation. Um, AVB, TSN, as we learned the other uh, day with Richard Bug, who did a wonderful webinar on AVB, TSN. Um, AVB has been around for some while now. And um, up until the introduction of Milan, the so-called stream format that was used is known as AM824. Uh, this is the stream format that has been used historically up to the introduction of Milan AVB, which is a protocol that runs on top of AVB. Want to know more about it? Be sure to watch the AVB Milan Milan AVB webinar by Richard Buck that we conducted on last Monday. So if you're using Milan AVB, which is now the default with the latest version of the Compass Control software or the latest firmware of uh, Galaxy devices, um, when Milan was released, the Avenue organization, the Avenue Alliance, felt that AAF stream format was superior to AM824 stream format. And that means that for people that are using the latest version, which is all Milan AVB, uh, because Galaxy devices, as you might know, are Milan certified, uh, they make use of the so-called AAF stream format and that requires a different firmware to run on uh, different firmware to run on your Galaxy devices or even on your Cal Column Array loudspeakers in order to make use of that stream format. So for the latest version, there is a different app as for the versions that came before the release of Milan. Um, so depending on your ecosystem, whether you're making use of Milan AVB or not, you want to use one of these two versions of the app. Um, for obvious reasons, Milan AVB is a wonderful solution, as we learned. So that means that uh, I will continue using the latest version from here on, which is uh, the version that supports the AAF stream format. You can download them uh, from the App Store, and that is, um, you know, anyone that has an iOS device uh, that is pretty much self-explanatory. If you fire up the app, um, this is the first screen that you will see. It's uh, known as the home view. What you see in front of you is a view, and by default, the app opens to the home view. And uh, it will automatically, you know, provided you're connected to the network, the same network that has your um, Galaxy or Callisto or Galileo devices living on them. If you're connected to the same network by wire or wireless, 
the app will automatically start looking for devices. And if devices are on the network, they, shall, they will show up in the list of uh, discovered devices. So, so why, don't we, uh, why don't we start doing? That means that I'm gonna temporarily uh, quit the keynote for now. And notice that um, in front of you, we see the mature compass control software on the left side. And on the right side, we see a, a screen capture of my iPad. Now, explaining these kind of things on an iPad is somewhat involved because by default, you cannot see where my screen is touching the display. Um, so in order to make it possible for you to see where my finger is on the uh, display, I have to use um, the Apple's uh, built-in uh, feature, which is called assistive touch. So this gray circle that you see over here, uh, this is part of the iOS um, um, operating uh, system. This has nothing to do with what we're about to discover, but this is the only way that I can show you where my finger is as I'm touching the glass. Uh, otherwise, I would be saying uh, I might be touching the screen over here or touching that, and you would go like, well, I don't know because I can't see. So um, occasionally might me see open up this dialogue to bring up this and that allows me to you know, show where my finger is. So on my um, iPad, Compass Go is already downloaded and installed, which means that I'm gonna click on the app and there we go. So there you see the home screen and notice that I'm making use uh, of a virtual galaxy, um, which uh, is functionally the same as having a physical galaxy on the network. And notice also that it immediately pops up uh, in the home view uh, saying, I've discovered a, a Galaxy device, which is called My Galaxy. So uh, notice that the name of this Galaxy device, which is a 408 model, uh, that it has the same name as My Galaxy in um, My Galaxy in the Mature Compass control software. So that is very convenient. Okay. Let's go back to the keynote temporarily and uh, look at um, what it is that we're, uh, that we're seeing here. So this will be some back and forth. Um, so we see a screen not unlike the one that we have over here. Notice that at the bottom of the screen, we see three features. We see three options to choose from. Um, let's highlight those options at the bottom of the screen a little bit more. Because the home view has uh, three, um, basically is a collection of three pages. By default, we start on the page showing the processors. But from the home view, I can also start designing custom layouts, which we will do by the end of today's webinar. And I can go to uh, settings. Um, settings relating to the Compass Go uh, control software. So uh, why don't we look into that? Why don't we go to our app? I'm gonna bring up my little gizmo so that you can see where my finger is. Um, so notice that now we're in processors, uh, showing me the processors in the home view. Let's go to settings and see what there's to see once I go to settings. So top to bottom, um, we have over here, we have our uh, selection timeout. Selection timeout basically means that if I choose a parameter and do not mess with it, for three seconds that it automatically gets deselected. Um, the second option is the idle timer, which means that the Compass Go app uh, prevents your iPad from accidentally going to sleep or you know, locking you out, having you to enter your code again or use your, you know, your, your fingerprint depending on uh, the device. This is something that you obviously can turn off. Um, there's also a parameter with respect to uh, matrix router mode. Uh, this is something that we discussed in the um, Mature Compass webinar where we discussed summing mode and direct routing. Um, I will touch upon that a little bit during the course of today's webinar. Then there is a, a global setting. Oops, there's a global setting that allows me to uh, set the sensitivity uh, of the app, that is to say, depending on how big of a move I make with my finger, the sensitivity will determine uh, how big a change in a value will be. So if I'm you know, moving a fader up and down, then the sensitivity will, be, will basically determine um, um, how many dBs change I introduce per, per distance uh, 
of finger movement. Um, we can manage our starting points. Um, I think we can skip that for now. Um, and then there is uh, the option to look at the version and um, end user alignment uh, agreement, privacy policy, and some acknowledgements. That concludes pretty much uh, the, the settings um, portion of the home view. So let's go back to our uh, processors. Um, Space map, sorry, Compass Go <laughs> is informing me that it has found a galaxy, but I'm not connected to it at this point because notice that in uh, notice that in front, notice that in oops, notice that in front of the um, notice that in front of my galaxy there's this little uh, yellow warning triangle informing me that I'm not connected. However, the moment I tick on the iPad, I put my finger and I tip this uh, galaxy unit, it starts to connect and it takes me to the second view that I would like to discuss with you, which is known as the overview view. Um, what we see here is basically three rows of eight channels. The um, top uh, row showing eight channels are my inputs, uh, inputs A all the way through input H. Whereas in Compass, it's not organized in a row, it's organized in a column. So in Compass, we're looking at inputs A through H from the top. And um, maybe it's prudent, oh, well, let's, let's keep it like this. So far, so good. Um, so rather than being organized top to bottom, it's uh, organized left to right. The second row shows me the first batch of eight outputs, numbered A1, number one, all the way through eight. And then uh, the, uh, let me move this out of the way temporarily. And then the bottom row shows me output nine all the way through output 16. Um, so that is our overview view. Now, before we start looking at any of the other views, there's a couple of things that I would like to point out for which I will go back to the uh, keynote presentation. So let me bring this up um, because uh, notice that when we are in the overview view, that um, there is an element uh, in the top left corner which is always there uh, regardless of what view I'm looking at. So the, the, the five uh, or six buttons that we see in the top left corner are always there in all of those views with exception of the home view. Um, so what do those buttons do? Where do they take us? Well, they basically take us to our views. If we press on the icon showing the three uh, Galaxy devices or three Galileo devices, it takes us back to that home view, which is the one that you see when you fire up the app. Um, currently, we are in the overview view, which you can tell because it's highlighted in white. So currently we are in the overview view, but it's also here when I can go to the I.O. view, I can go to the view showing me my EQ, and I can go to the view showing my matrix, and I can go to the view where I can access uh, settings. And this uh, part of the graphical user interface is always living in the top left corner. That's where we switch between our views. At the same time, there is a part of the GUI, the graphical user interface, in the top right corner, which is also always there. And these, is, these are what are known as the global controls. And uh, for those that make use of computers uh, regularly, of course, the first two options are uh, speak for themselves, which are my undo and my redo options. The disk icon, uh, which is somewhat archaic, but the disk icon, is, uh, is where I can manage my snapshots. And then ultimately we have uh, the, the wrench, which is my uh, tools icon. This is always living in the top right corner. So there's a couple of elements in the graphical user interface, which are at all times there, which is in the top left corner where I choose my views. And in the top right corner, I have my global controls. Okay, um, let's start looking at you know, what there is to do uh, using those features. Now, before we go to any of those other views, um, I'd like to, um, I'd like to, oops, my iPad locked itself out. I'd like to um, go over uh, what we see in our overview view. Let me bring up my little gizmo 
it is pretty much uh, self-explanatory. Mute speaks for itself. If I were to tap this mute button, notice that uh, input A is now unmuted and you can also confirm this on the mature co uh, uh, compass control software. Notice that it's also unmuted in the mature version. If I were to tap it again, then input A is muted once more. And it's very important to point out that this is completely bilingual. Uh, what I mean is that if I make a change in the Compass Go software, then it's instantaneously updated in the mature Compass version. But this is also true vice versa. If I were to unmute this input in the mature version of Compass, then you also notice that uh, Compass Go follows in lockstep. Uh, nearly instantaneous. So I can, you know, mute and unmute inputs and outputs and notice that um, we see that also taking place in Compass. Same is true for my outputs, which live in row number two and number three. So this is where I can start muting my outputs. Pretty self-explanatory by just tapping, tipping on the screen, I can unmute those outputs. So far, so good. Uh, pretty self-explanatory. Um, what can I do here? Well, I can select multiple channels. Um, if I press the select icon, then it goes green. And notice that you can also see in the Mature Compass uh, control software, you see that I've now selected all my inputs at once, which means that if I unmute only one of these, I unmute all of them because they are now uh, selected all at once. They are linked. If you want to know more about uh, linking, whether it's linking on a, on, a, on a local galaxy or linking across multiple galaxies, which we refer to as global linking, be sure to watch Oscar Barrientos um, Compass Global Overview webinar, which discusses uh, linking at great length. There's, of course, also the option to isolate channels, uh, isolate channels from a selection um, and it works uh, functionally the same as you have come to expect of the mature version of uh, Compass. I also see my gain settings in the overview view. And if I want to change any of those gain settings, um, I can double click, which allows me to enter a numerical value. Um, so let's put that to test. I double clicked on that um, value that we saw over there. Uh, a display pops up and it allows me to introduce a value. Um, notice that there's the option to change the sign. And um, as you have come to expect from uh, Compass, the mature version is that um, if you do not specify a sign, then any value you enter by default will be negative. Um, this is to prevent a temporary threshold shift. Okay, You do not want to accidentally uh, add 20 decibels of gain when you intended to take out 20 decibels of gain. So if you do not specify a sign, then all values by default will be negative values. That being said, if I specify a sign and do negative 20 uh, and press done, notice that this channel is now attenuated by 20 decibels. I can also confirm this by looking at the mature version of uh, Compass. And because it's bilingual, I could also restore this to zero. And of course, Compass Go is updating in real time. That being said, if I want to enter a positive value, then I have to deliberately use the sign button and make it a plus. That is the only way that I can get a 10 dB boost. This is just a contingency, which is very convenient and uh, will keep you from doing um, operator errors that result into temporary threshold shifts. Um, sure has happened to me, so don't worry about that. Um, okay, now another way that I can manipulate this value is by tip and drag with my finger while pressing the glass. In order for you to show this, I need to uh, disable my gizmo temporarily. That's the only way I can make it work. But I'm now tipping that same field and I'm dragging my finger. I'm dragging my finger up and down. So I'm swiping the screen and notice that I'm now changing that gain incrementally okay so that's the other way you can do it i can also do this by going to input d clicking that box and then i can drag my finger up and down on the glass and this is how i change that value very convenient 
Okay, let's zero that out once more uh, because that pretty much uh, concludes what is there, what is to see in the uh, global, in the overview view. Now, um, important thing to point out, let me bring up my gizmo, is that um, in the top right corner, we have the tool. Sorry, I did not intend to go there yet. In the top right corner, we have the tool, and the tool offers a unique set of features, offers a unique set of features depending on which view you are in. So if I were to press on the tool right now, then I see the features that are unique for this particular view, which is the overview view. Now, <clears throat> we did a webinar where we discussed virtual SIM. And in virtual SIM, we make use of the triple channel transfer function where we use so-called console and uh, processor pro points. And um, that is uh, unique to a Myersound ecosystem. And if I want to see where those control and processor pro points live, then I need to enable the option that allows me, I need to disable my gizmo temporarily, that allows me to show those C's and P's. And those are the C's and P's as in console and processor pro points. It's beyond the scope of, uh, beyond the scope of what we're doing today. If you wanna know more about this, be sure to watch the uh, virtual SIM webinar that we conducted last week. I'm gonna disable this once more and, um, and I'm done with the tools for this particular view. So without further ado, let's go to the second view in the Compass Go, which is our I.O. view. If I click on the I.O. view, you see that it's now highlighted in white, and here I see all my inputs and outputs in, uh, in, in, in uh, batches of eight channels. So notice that, uh, indicated by the white color, we're currently looking at a batch of eight channels, which are our input channels A uh, through H. Um, Again, over here, there is the option uh, in this case to enter delay times. These would be delay times assigned to the inputs. So if I were to double tap and do 10 milliseconds, then you notice that um, in input A, there is now a 10 millisecond delay, which you can also tell from the mature uh, compass version. So let me zero that out. Also from this view, I have once more the option to select multiple channels and manipulate them all at once. You can also see upstairs over here, you can also see uh, that I've selected those eight channels at once. Um, in a similar way, I can isolate channels from my selection uh, that is the same uh, functionality. Um, Right now, I selected all those inputs at once. But if I click in the grid that we see at the top of our screen, then we get a drop-down menu. And in this drop-down menu, I could have done the same by simply pressing those arrows. If I press an arrow on either side of my input, I select all of them at once. Okay, so rather than having to select them um, one at a time, I could do it in this fashion as well. Um, same is true for my outputs. I can also, in one go, uh, if we go down a couple of rows, I can also select all my outputs at once and mute them if I wanted to. You can also see in the mature version of Compass that um, all my outputs are selected. So that's very convenient. This grid lives at the top of your screen. If you tip it, um, this pops up. If you tip it again, it goes away. Um, what else is there to see over here? I see uh, what kind of physical inputs on the back of my uh, Galileo device, uh, on the back of my Galileo device, have been assigned to my input channels, which is also something that we discussed during prior webinars. So if I click over here on the AES3, then we see that the current input type for input A is uh, an AES3 uh, input which you could also tell from the mature Compass software because it also shows you, if you pay attention to the meter, it also shows you that currently an AES3 input is assigned to that particular channel. But maybe I have reason to turn this into an analog input and if I click analog, then uh, notice that it no longer reads AES3, it now reads um, analog. And the same is of course true for AVB. So this is where I can conveniently 
assign physical inputs on the back of my Galileo device to the input channels. Um, and this is also where, if I want, I can set up uh, link groups. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, um, I can go to the wrench in the top right corner, which is my tool. And if I click this, then uh, I am mistaken. Okay, so we'll get to that later. Um, but this is also where I can set up my link groups. Um, so by clicking on LG, as in link group, I can start assigning these guys to uh, link groups. I need to disable my gizmo, but I can make this guy part of link group one. Um, we'll look at that a little bit more in depth uh, once we get to uh, another part of the app. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I want the gizmo back. So that pretty much concludes uh, all that there's to do over here. Of course, I can, uh, I can label my inputs. If I click on the name of any input, then I can use the uh, display on my screen and I can name this, uh, uh, you know, I can name this whatever I want. I can say, okay, this is my input, okay? And now below the fader, it will read my input. Um, so this is one of many places where I can change uh, the labels. Goes without saying that uh, I can move the fader with my finger. So if I disable the gizmo, if I disable the gizmo temporarily and I put my finger on the fader, then I can move the, uh, change the input gain of this particular channel. Of course, um, hopefully you understand by now, I can also click on the numerical value, double tap that, and then change the value by entering a value. So let's zero that out. Um, I can do this for my inputs um, in a batch of eight channels, but if we go to the top of our screen, I can also go to outputs one through eight, and I can go through output one, uh, nine through 16, and I have the same functionality. So that pretty much concludes the I.O. view um, where I have um, my inputs and outputs. So let's go to the fourth view in the top, which is the EQ, uh, the EQ view. Currently, um, we are looking at input H. You can see that uh, there is a white bracket, a white bracket living around input H uh, in the top grid. And you can also see in the bottom left corner that we're currently looking at input H. If I wanna go to any of those other inputs, I can of course open up the grid and go directly to uh, input A, or I can use the arrows left and right of the grid at the top of the screen to uh, step through my inputs and ultimately outputs in, in, uh, in increments of uh, one step. So currently we're looking at uh, the input channel. Again, um, at the input channel, in this um, notice by the, the highlighting, we're currently looking at channel. This is of course another opportunity for me to uh, label that input channel if I desire to do so. Um, I can change the delay time also here. I can select this channel if I desire to do so. I can isolate it. Um, and what I can do over here is assign an input. So I can also do it from here. Again, several stages where I can uh, assign an input. And also over here, we have the option to make this input channel part of a link group. That being said, uh, since we're looking at input F, I can also do a five band parametric EQ. So why don't we go to the same channel in the mature? In the mature version, we go to the same channel, which is input F, okay? We go to the patometric top, and now you should be able to appreciate that by using my finger, okay, I can select any of those bands, okay? There's five input parametric EQs on a Galaxy, and uh, there's several ways how I can change the values. I can, of course, uh, select the uh, frequency or the bandwidth or the amount of attenuation or... Um, gain by double clicking any of those fields and enter a, a, a value numerically but it wouldn't be you know it would be super convenient if there was for me a way just to click you know a band and just use my finger and move over the screen while pressing the second band and this is how i can change my corner frequency 
and this is how I can change the amount of cut or the amount of boost. And if I'm not mistaken, if I pinch using my fingers or spread, I can also change uh, the bandwidth. I can even zoom. Um, this is always where I'm a little bit lost in my, uh, in my shortcuts. Uh, if I use three fingers, the three finger, okay. So <clears throat> this is me mixing my shortcuts up. If I want to change the bandwidth, I can also do so by using my gizmo and go to the bandwidth parameter, click on that particular field, and then uh, while pressing it, you know, selecting that field and moving my finger up and down, or change the bandwidth uh, numerically. Okay. So changing the bandwidth at this point appears to be numerically only. Um, so I owe you an answer because I'm pretty sure that I can also do this using my fingers. Okay, remains to be seen. That being said, five bands of input EQ. Um, of course, I can also bypass any of those bands at any time. I can do it one at a time, uh, bypass any of those bands one at a time, or if I use the yellow arrow icon on the left side, I can bypass all of them at once. Okay, so when the band is selected and I pinch, I zoom, the band is selected, I pinch. Okay, there we go. So notice that you can tell that it's highlighted in blue. Band number two is highlighted in blue. I have the author of the software uh, reaching out to me in the chat, which is amazing. He's saving my, uh, my back. So uh, once the band is selected, I can uh, change the width of the band by using um, the pinch, provided the band is selected. Much appreciated. Okay, um, so let's look what our tool does in this particular view. So we go to the tool in the top right corner and notice that um, this allows me, depending on my needs, to turn on or turn off certain filters. But this is also where I can reset uh, an EQ at any, uh, if I desire to reset a, a EQ, then I can also do it here. So with one click of a button, I can reset my parametric EQ, my U shaping, or all EQ in this particular input channel uh, together. Pretty um, self-explanatory. Of course, on our inputs, we also have U shaping, which is our proprietary multiband EQ, um, where we can introduce different amounts of um, gain and attenuation. Um, let me disable my gizmo because that this uh, uh, prohibits me from uh, dragging. But this is, you know, but by clicking the band, I can make various different uh, EQ shapes um, using our proprietary uh, multiband EQ. Notice that all of this is also uh, updated in um, the mature version of Compass. So let's bring the gizmo back and uh, reset this uh, once more. Finally, um, we also have all pass filters, but not on the input. You can see that it's grayed out. Those filters are only available on the output. So um, let's go up a couple of channels and let's go to output channel number one. You can tell in the grid that it's selected because there's the rectangular grid, the, the re rectangular bracket around it. Um, so we're now at output one. And of course in output one, um, we have more processing options than we have on our input channels. Uh, again, there's the option for me to change the name of this output to uh, set a delay time. Of course, I have the same select isolation and link group features uh, that um, we we look into. And this is also where I can reverse the polarity uh, because I can reverse polarity on output channels. So if I click polarity, then it says reversed. Um, it says reversed and notice that if in the mature version I go to the uh, to the overview, notice that uh, my output channel shows that this is uh, reversed as well. Very convenient. Or of course, I can also mute an output over here. And this is also where we uh, where we use. Let me move my uh, uh, assistive touch out of the way. This is also where we can enable our product integration. Uh, product integration is something that we dedicated an entire webinar on. Um, so be sure to watch that. But here I have the same functionality. This is where I can say, okay, today I'm uh, I'm using uh, I'm using uh, uh, I'm using uh, melody, 
and I want the melody to be uh, uh, to exhibit a phase curve that is a member of the PC125 phase curve family. And uh, I press done, and then you notice that as well in the mature version of Compass, as well in Compass Go, that we've now enabled um, product integration for that specific output channel. Um, so that is what you can set over here. Uh, same functionality. I need to undo my gizmo in order to move up and down because I want to use no product integration done. But that is where we can introduce the same uh, product integration. Of course, I have my high pass and low pass filters and my atmosphere correction. All of that is living here as well. In order you for, for you to appreciate it, let's go to output processing, output one, so that we can see that in action. If I were now to take this filter out of bypass, then we see the high pass filter. The same goes for our low pass filter. And of course, by um, selecting any of those um, of those gizmos, I can change the corner frequency by simply clicking and uh, dragging, change the corner frequency. Uh, goes without saying that at any time I can also change the typology of filter. Uh, if I double click where it says second order legacy, I get a list where I can choose any of the other filters that are uh, available within the Galileo devices. And the same is true for the low pass. Um, there's also my atmospheric correction, which is the built-in feature that allows you to overcome the attenuation of high frequencies over distance, a similar functionality. Uh, notice that it's bypassed, but I can take it out of bypass with uh, great ease. Um, so let's see what our tool does for this uh, dialogue. Uh, again, this is the tool for the EQ view. Again, depending on our needs, we can hide and show certain functionality, and we can also uh, change uh, change the, um, uh, we can undo the EQ uh, altogether. So let's reset this uh, to default. Notice that over here, I can also choose a starting point which is also part of product integration. Uh, be sure to watch the webinar uh, to learn more about that. Um, let me kill my gizmo um, so that I can scroll down the list. So for all I know, this might be a part of a lion, uh, uh, an output that feeds a, a lion element. Then I might have reason to use the lion M EQ starting point. A dialog pops up and says, uh, do you want to overwrite your current settings? I'm going to say, okay. And now that starting point has been recalled in that particular output channel. Um, more about that in the product integration uh, webinar. So uh, let's reset this uh, once more. And um, let's reset this once more. And of course, we also have in our outputs, we have parametric. Uh, we have 10 bands of parametric EQ rather than five. We have U-shaping um, that we already discussed. And we have our all pass filters, uh, three bands to be specific. So if I were to take those out of bypass, then I can introduce additional phase shift without touching the magnitude response, a very powerful tool. Um, and, but we'll discuss that uh, during another uh, time. So that pretty much uh, concludes, pretty much concludes, uh, pretty much concludes the EQ view. So uh, let's go to the um, next view, which is option number five, which brings us to the matrix. Now we've done an entire webinar on, um, we've done an entire webinar on matrixing. Uh, it's called channel delivery. So uh, I introduced it at the beginning. Notice that here we see the matrix. We see eight put in, uh, input rows, uh, which are input rows A through H. Uh, so we have a similar similar situation as you see in the mature version of Compass. Um, in gain mode, in gain mode, I can change the value at any of the cross points. We call this cross points. So this is where input A is linked to output one, the physical output on the back of my device. In gain mode, uh, I can use, uh, I can select that cross point. Notice that after three seconds because of the timeout option, it automatically selects. But if I select that cross point, I can use any of the values at the top of the screen and set the gain at that cross point to a value of my choosing. Of course, I can also double click 
at the cross point itself and enter a numerical version. Uh, by now, surely you start to understand the wonderful philosophy behind uh, this app. Um, if I want to see the remainder of my matrix, because the matrix on any Galaxy device is a 32 by 16 matrix, that is to say 32 input rows by 16 output columns, there are several ways that I can do that. I can simply scroll down using my finger, I can scroll down all the way to the bottom of the matrix, and then you see that the bottom input row is 32, <clears throat> making this a 32 by 16 uh, matrix. That's one way of doing it, but there's also the option in Compass Go to see the expanded matrix. And for this, I need to pinch. And if I pinch, then uh, let's wait for it. If I pinch, okay, there we go. Then I can see the entire expanded matrix at, at once. So now I see all 32 input rows, top to bottom, and I see all uh, possible options uh, to set uh, cross points. So that is your gain mode. Uh, let me contract the matrix once more by doing a spread rather than a pinch. Um, let's wait for it. Okay, so now we're back in the normal view, um, so showing us only uh, eight put in rows, input rows at once. Um, okay, so let me bring up my gizmo and let's go to router mode. Um, in router mode, notice that uh, it basically becomes a matter of on or off. So uh, rather than being able to set uh, different values at the cross point, it is the choice between uh, negative infinity, which for all intents and purposes is on or turn uh, off or turn it on by clicking on any of the cross points. Notice that this behavior is similar to summing mode. Um, so right now I'm sending inputs A through F all to physical output number seven. Uh, and that's why it's called summing mode. Sometimes this might not be desired, in which case uh, we go to the wrench. If I go to the wrench, this is where that option comes into play, which is called direct router mode. Um, if we go to direct router mode, then uh, we abandon the summing mode and I can no longer assign multiple inputs to the same output. Now it becomes a matter of, okay, currently we have output one, uh, input A going to output one, but I cannot send input A and input B to output one at the same time. Now I can only have one input per output. I can have, uh, I can have the same input across multiple outputs, but I can only have one input output put there's no more possibility to sum if you want to know more about this behavior be sure to watch the um, matrix webinar that we discuss this behavior at a uh, great length so that's where your tool comes into play that's where your direct router mode comes into play and finally uh, as of galaxy we not only have a summing matrix but we can also set uh, a delay time at every cross point uh, besides the gain. So that is similar functionality. Okay, so that takes care of the first five views. Um, let's go to the gear icon. The gear icon is the sixth option. It's the sixth option in the, um, is the sixth option in the views. And um, at the top of the list, we have our snapshots. So this is where I can start uh, managing uh, uh, snapshots. Um, Maybe I have reason to add a snapshot. Um, we'll, we'll look at that more in depth in a while, but um, let's go to our project. Over here, I see my list of snapshots and maybe I've made something that I greatly enjoy. All that I have to do is press on the plus icon in the top right corner and that brings up a dialogue saying that you're about to create a new snapshot. So I can go there and uh, I can call that my you know, first uh, snapshot. Um, you know, snapshot. Okay, this keeps getting better. First snap shot. Okay, and notice that um, as well as in Compass Go, we now have two snapshots rather than one. And you can also see in the mature version that we have two um, snapshots uh, rather than one. If I want to delete a snapshot because for all I know, I made it accidentally. Then all that I have to do is swipe it like you would do with a contact on your iPhone. If I swipe it, 
uh, notice that there is an option to delete it. And if I delete it, it disappears from the list on Compass Go and it disappears from the list in the mature version of uh, Compass. So that is a pretty uh, self-explanatory at um, this point, similar functionality. Um, this is also where I can enable my um, LMBC. We yet have to do a um, we yet have to do a webinar on LMBC, but suffices to say that this is where we have the same functionality. And uh, this is the part that I was looking for. This is where I also can um, set my link groups. So if I go to the overview in the mature version. And now I can make my link groups, okay? All of these inputs that I'm now assigning are becoming a member of link group number one. Uh, and all that's left to do is enable it. So I'm gonna disable my gizmo so that I can enable it. Notice the color change in the mature version of Compass that it goes from blue to yellow. That is to say from disabled to enabled. Um, in the webinar done by Oscar Barrientos, we already learned that if you have a link group that it suffices to select only one channel of the link group and then all channels that are a member of the link group uh, get selected at once. And uh, of course, in Compass Go, you have the same uh, functionality. Okay, so uh, let me undo that. Um, let me take these guys out of the link group and uh, let's disable that. And what else do we have here? Well, we have device settings. So what we see over here is similar information as I see in my network top. So I see the name of my entity. Uh, uh, I see, uh, you know, the um, uh, if it has a serial number, which it currently doesn't because I'm using a, a virtual galaxy. But I see similar metrics, similar performance, uh, similar information as you would expect to see in the uh, network top of the mature version. Then there is, of course, the possibility to look at input and output settings. This is also dealing with uh, AVB. We have the same... We have the same kind of information in the mature version of Compass, which is our uh, presentation time. If you want to know more about presentation time, which has to do with Milan AVB, be sure to watch Richard's bug uh, webinar. But this is also um, where uh, I can assign once more the physical inputs on the back of uh, the Galaxy or Callisto or Galileo. I can assign those uh, to any of those inputs also from within uh, this dialogue. Some options regarding uh, clock source settings, like are we using the internal clock or are we uh, syncing to uh, an external clock? Uh, what is the sample rate? Um, and also some information regarding AVB, which we're currently not using in today's example. Also over here, I have again the same dialogue regarding the um, console and pro points uh, within the SIM3 ecosystem. All of that is accessible from this dialogue as well. Um, so that takes us through our views. Um, we started in the home view where we see our devices. Um, by clicking on any of those devices, we can go to the overview view, which is analogous to the overview in the mature version of Compass. And then of course, we can go to our input output functionality, our IO view, we can go to our IQ, we can go to our matrix, and then the last view is settings. Uh, that pretty much allows you to do everything that you can do in the mature version of Compass and store and organize that in snapshots that you can recall as well. Um, which means that for the remainder 15 minutes or so, I would like uh, to discuss uh, arguably the most interesting feature, which is the feature that allows us to make custom layouts. Custom layouts in a similar fashion as control groups and control pages within the mature version of Compass. Uh, be sure to watch that webinar if it has your interest. Um, and today I was thinking of maybe doing a practical example. And, uh, and the example could be, um, what if we're dealing with a restaurant? Why don't we look at a restaurant situation today? So uh, I'm going to bring up the keynote. I need to organize uh, the interface of Zoom temporarily. I'm going to bring up the keynote. And imagine that we are dealing with a restaurant today, okay? Um, a restaurant, what is there to see? Well, I see that there are booths for the patrons to sit. There's a dining area. There's an entrance. 
Uh, there's a waiting area. Of course, there are restrooms. There's a kitchen. Otherwise, there would be no food. There is a bar. And surrounding the bar is a lounge area. And there looks to be uh, some, some area that could actually serve as a, as a potential dance floor. So why don't we attempt at making a, um, a custom layout in the Compass Go uh, app uh, that allows us to address these zones uh, individually. So maybe we have reason, you know, to, um, to turn down the level in the boots because people are trying to have a conversation or in the dining area. But maybe we have reason to turn up the level uh, on the dance floor. Or maybe the people that are sitting around the bar, um, sitting around the bar, sitting around the bar, sitting around the bar is um, want to watch a, a, a soccer match uh, while everybody else is trying to have um, dinner. And uh, maybe the people in the, in the lounge area would like uh, to listen to music, but um, not that loud, would like to listen to it at a, uh, a little bit less loud level than on the uh, dance floor. So um, this is something where Intelligent DC is a very common solution. Uh, which are externally powered loudspeakers. Um, so, you know, this with a couple of MPSs uh, and some distributed loudspeakers, this, this is a very common scenario. And how could we make a custom layout that would allow a non-audio professional using an iPad to still exercise some control uh, over such uh, an installation without needing uh, an audio professional? Well, that is something okay, that we can do with uh, custom layouts. And mind you, we're going to only scratch the surface. We're only going to scratch the surface, um, but um, a custom layouts almost gives you exactly the same functionality as the um, control groups and control pages. So you can make this as complicated uh, as you want, but I thought this might be a cute, uh, a cute exercise. So uh, let's go back to the um, sharing of the screens. If I want to make a custom layout, then uh, let's bring up the gizmo, then I go to the home view. And um, I prepared something uh, for, uh, for this practical demonstration. And that means that I go to my inventory. Uh, I'm done with the Galaxy that we've been using so far, so I'm gonna disconnect from that Galaxy. I have no more purpose for it. Uh, and I'm gonna go to the other device that I prepared for this demonstration, which is a 408, because in a restaurant, you know, a 408 might suffice. Perfectly, that 408 has four physical inputs, eight physical outputs. So I'm going to use this as a virtual one. And um, notice that it immediately shows up in Compass Go as well once it's on the network. And um, I uh, want to go to my uh, starting, uh, starting uh, snapshot. So I made a project for this that I'm temporarily going to recall uh, to save myself uh, from the work that I already did. Okay, prevent myself having to work. And I'm gonna recall this snapshot, which is called start here. So imagine that we have a, a 408, a 408 uh, in our restaurant. We know that our restaurant has uh, several zones. There might be zone one, which is uh, the people that are sitting or possibly having dinner at the bar. There is zone two, which are the booths that we saw in the, uh, in the schematic drawing. Then there's the dining area, there's zone four, which is our dance floor, and then surrounding the dance floor, there is the lounge area. And for all I know, I might wanna you know, um, run that with um, four outputs on my 408. Um, and today I made up that we might have background music, left, right, stereo feed, and maybe we have a receiver, a satellite receiver or a cable receiver because people occasionally would like to watch a sports event. So uh, on our 408, we have four inputs. Uh, two, uh, we have a stereo feed for the background music, and we have a stereo feed uh, coming from our receiver, whether it's satellite or cable um, from our receiver. And we have uh, five zones. And now we would like to make a um, would like to make a custom layout um, so that a non-audio professional can still operate that installation. So my iPad uh, went into uh, lockdown, so let me fix that. Okay, I'm gonna bring up my gizmo so that you see where my finger is. Let's go at the bottom of our screen and let's go to custom layout. Now, notice that I already prepared something. So I would like you to see the possible finished end result first, and then we'll discuss how to make that. So um, 
of the two custom layouts that I made over here, I want to go to the one that is called My Restaurant. And notice that in My Restaurant, we have a custom page, a user-defined page uh, that we're currently looking at. Um, what has not happened at this point is that I have not assigned the um, Galaxy device in Compass Go. I have not uh, connected it to the Galaxy device on the network. So what I'm going to go do is I'm going to go to the top right corner. I'm going to click on my devices and notice that my five, my 408 Galaxy has a red uh, square in front of it telling me that it's not mapped, it's not tethered, if you will, to the physical Galaxy on my network. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the third option from the top. I'm going to go to map devices and notice that in the left column, we see the devices in the custom layout. And in the right column, we see the discovered devices on the network. And notice that these two are not connected with each other. So in order to make that happen, I'm going to click on my device in the custom layout. And I'm going to click on my device on the network. Now they are tethered by an umbilical cord. And once I do that, OK, once that is in place, my custom layout comes to life. And notice that in this final result, we have two pages. In this page, I can mute all zones individually. So I've set it in such a way that if I want to mute the sound at the bar, that all I have to do is click over here and notice that that zone has now been muted. You can also see this in the mature version of Compass, that zone has been muted. Uh, the same is true for if I want to kill the lounge area, now the lounge area is muted. If I want to um, have silence in the booth because people are trying to have a conversation, now that is muted. Same is true, of course, for the dining area and for the dance floor. So this is very intuitive. I think it goes without saying that a, a non-audio professional with a minimum amount of instruction would be able to operate this. In the top right corner, we have a big fat mute all button, which allows us to mute the entire system at once. Pretty self-explanatory. And notice that I've also over here prepared the option to recall snapshots. Because for all we know, on a given day, there might be reason to listen to background music everywhere. Notice that um, snapshot A over here is the snapshot that makes it happen that background music is heard, heard in all zones. So if I go to my project over here, Currently, we are in snapshot number one. But the moment I press background music everywhere, we get a dialogue in Compass Go asking me, do you want to recall this snapshot? And this is a wonderful security feature because I have to execute a move to make this happen. I need to click on that um, gizmo in the middle of the screen, and I need to drag it either toward yes, or I need to drag it either toward no, so that I cannot accidentally, with a slip of the finger, recall a preset unintentionally. So I'm going to click it, I'm going to drag it to yes, and boom, we go to snapshot number two. Notice that in the Compass Go uh, application that there's now a green box telling me that this is the snapshot that is currently activated. You can also tell this from the mature version of Compass, this is the current snapshot. And what has changed in this snapshot is that my stereo feed on input a and B has been unmuted, and you can tell in the summing matrix that I've met a monosum because it's a distributed system in, in, in very often, so stereo is you know remains to be seen. Notice that uh, a monosum minus six and minus six of each input is going through each of the five zones, and that is what this preset would recall. But in a restaurant, in a bar, it's also very much possible. Uh, very much possible that um, some people might want to enjoy or watch a sports event, maybe at the bar, whereas everybody else in the restaurant is still trying to have dinner and, and wants to enjoy background music. So notice that I made a second uh, snapshot living over here, which says TV sound at bar, background music everywhere else. So if I recall this snapshot, guess what is going to change? Guess what I'm going to change? If I now say yes, notice that inputs three and four have now been unmuted 
And if you look at the matrix, you can tell that those inputs are now only going to the bar, which means that only the people that are having dinner or sitting at the bar are now listening to the receiver, whether it's a satellite or a cable receiver. But for all you know, you might have a soccer tournament and now everybody in the restaurant wants to enjoy the sports event, not just the people sitting at the bar, in which case you, of course, can make a preset, which is called TV Sound Everywhere. And if we recall TV Sound Everywhere, now notice that my background music has been muted and everybody in all zones is now listening to the feed coming from the receiver. And uh, I think it's safe to say that a non-audio professional should be able to execute these steps with um, relevant uh, ease. Notice, however, that if we go to our Compass Go app, and I bring my gizmo back, that we have these arrow uh, icons to the left and right of my custom layout, which is called my restaurant, because a custom layout can contain multiple pages. And this layout that I made earlier today actually has two pages, because the second page allows me to set the level in each of these zones, which is also, I think, at times is important. Somebody in booth might say, can you turn it down a little bit in the booth? For which I made a potentiometer to save real estate in my, in my, on my iPad screen. I made a potentiometer. It goes without saying that I can double click the value. And if somebody says, can you turn it down a little bit? I'm going to say, okay, let's turn that guy down by 10 dB. And notice that my potentiometer now lives at negative 10. And the value in the field above shows negative 10 as well. Notice that this is now the only zone, this is now the only zone that has been turned down by 10 decibels. Goes without saying that if I disable my gizmo, that I can also click and drag on the potentiometer itself. And now I can change that value by uh, just uh, moving my finger up and down, increase or attenuate the level in that zone and in that zone exclusively. And I can do this for each zone individual, in, individually in a very intuitive way. That being said, on the right side of the screen, I also made one big uh, master level control. This is what we call a spin wheel. Um, it's like a jog wheel, but it doesn't run clockwise. It runs, uh, you know, it's that other jog wheel. And um, that allows me to increase the entire level uh, or attenuate the entire level. I use the jog wheel because the fader required too much real estate, but that's a matter. That's a matter of uh, that's a matter of real estate, screen real estate. That is. So if I click the jog wheel, I can move the jog wheel up and down, and notice that all zones now become louder or become softer. And now comes an interesting thing that I'd like to point out. Let's zero this out. What happens if there are zones that are not as loud as other zones? Maybe the lounge is down by 10 dB. And maybe the dance floor is up by 5 dB because people are having a good time. And maybe uh, the people in the booth, um, you know, they want to have even less because that is where people typically gather to have a conversation. So maybe they're down by 20 decibels. Notice that as I start to attenuate these zones individually, that in my, in my master fader, that there is now a blue bar living next to the wheel. That blue bar says that of all the faders that are satellite faders to this master fader, that the loudest fader lives at plus five which is true, which is the dance floor. The dance floor lives at plus five, whereas the lowest fader lives at negative 20, which is also true, which are the people in the booth that are down by 20 decibels. So that blue bar living next to the jog wheel is now showing you the, um, showing you the range of levels that are assigned to each zone individually. It also means that the value that we see over here, the negative seven and a half dB, is the average value of all those zones together. That being said, if I were now to change the master level, then all these offsets are preserved nonetheless. If I change, if I lower the master level by three decibels, 
notice that the relative offsets that we introduced first have all been preserved. So that is uh, very convenient. Same is true if I increase it by another three decibels, making all zones three decibels louder, then also in that case, um, all the relative offsets that we introduced before have been preserved. And uh, as I said before, I think that somebody in the service industry, you know, in the service industry running a restaurant with little or no understanding of a sound system could operate this uh, with um, great ease. Which brings us to the point, how do you make such a custom layout? Okay, which will be the finale of today's webinar because this is something that I already um, prepared, but surely you can understand that this is just the tip of the iceberg. So let's go back to our um, custom layouts. If I want to make a custom layout at any point, all that I have to do is press the plus icon in the top right corner, which brings up a dialogue. Would you like to add another custom layout? I have no reason to do so because I already prepared one, which is called start here. So I'm gonna go to the start here. And that is where we have one page, page one, where I already imported the background picture. Now, how would you import such a background picture? Very simply, um, next to your devices, these are your devices, next to your devices, there is the option to introduce controls. And there are several controls to choose from. We can introduce a fader, we can introduce a rotary, we can introduce a spin dial, a wheel, a mute button, we can make a button to recall a snapshot, we can even display metering, we can show the response of an EQ curve, uh, we can show which snapshot is currently um, running, um, some functionality re uh, uh, related to Bluehorn beyond the scope of today's webinar, we can make labels and we can import a background image. If I would click background image, um, you would see um, a folder containing all sorts of photos of my family. Um, so that's the reason why I already imported the background, but it speaks for itself that that is where you would imp import uh, a background image. So I already did that. And that is just, you know, that's a placeholder. This allows me to position uh, the controls that I can introduce. Um, if I want to do this with great accuracy, I can go to edit in the top right corner, which, um, sorry, I can go to the wrench. And in the wrench, I can change uh, the tool icon. I can change the name of this layout, uh, the current page I can rename. I can delete this page altogether. And this is also the option where we can turn on a grid. And that grid then allows us to align our controls. You can also turn it off, uh, obviously. You can also turn it off. Uh, ever uh, afterwards. So that is just a grid for you to align your control points. Now, um, the first thing that we need to do is to connect the device in our custom layout. We have to connect the device. So let's add a device. Today we're using a 408. Okay, so let's give it a name and let's call this, uh, you know, my 408 my 408, we need to add a device. We need to instruct the app what kind of device it is. Um, so I'm using a Galaxy 408. So let's use the 408 Galaxy and let's say done. And then um, we want to enable auto mapping. Now, what does auto mapping mean? Um, in the Compass app, the devices that live in your custom layout are not automatically tethered to the devices that live on your network. But uh, once everything is in place, enable auto mapping will ensure that once you fire up the app, recall your custom layout, it will make it automatically happen that once you've set up everything, that your device in the custom layout is automatically tethered once more to the device living on the network. We yet have to do that because this is a new custom layout, but that option is very convenient. So I've given the name a device, I've, I've chosen the device type, and I enabled auto mapping. This is device that lives in my custom layout. Now I want to link that device, which is not mapped at this point. You can tell by the red square it's not mapped. I want to link this device to an actual 408 living on the network. 
So this is something that you already saw me do. Now I go to map devices. And here on the left side, you see the device that I just added in my custom layout. Whereas on the right side, you see the actual physical devices living on the network. And currently they are not connected by an umbilical cord. And that means that I'm gonna select this guy and I'm gonna select the other guy. That brings up the umbilical cord. Now they are tethered together. And now I can use my custom layout to operate that physical Galaxy device. If I want to sever the link at any time, all that I have to do is click both instances again. A cross shows up telling me that I'm about to sever that connection. Now they're not mapped. That being said, once this connection has been made, automatic remapping will make it happen that the next time you fire up that custom layout, that all of this happens automatically. So now my custom layout and its device is connected to a physical device in the real world. And you should also be able to tell that this is happening because rather than having a red square in front of my Galaxy, I now have a green circle telling me that we are successfully connected. And now that that's happened, I can start adding any of these controls. So uh, how would I make the master mute? I would choose a mute button, which brings up a dialog telling me uh, this is the kind of control label that you're using. I could also call this mute all, which I think I did. Okay mute all. Um, I can show that label, I can hide that label. It's pretty self-explanatory. What is the control point type? Well, it's a mute button, speaks for itself. Um, but now we need to instruct the control point. Would you like this mute to act on input channels or on output channels? Well, in this case, mute all, I might want to output all my, I want to mute all my output channels. So now, this is where the channel type, this is where I have to assign whether the mute function acts on the inputs or acts on the outputs. So I'm going to set this to output and then I go back to my mute button. I'm sorry, I have to confirm that by clicking done. Now I go back to the mute button settings and notice that now in the row below, I see the 16 outputs of that particular Galaxy device. So if I want to mute output one, two, three, four, and five all at once, then all that's left to do is to select those and press done. And there is my mute button in the top left corner. It's already operational. If I were to click it now, notice that those outputs are all muted. It also has a label underneath it, which reads mute all. But sometimes to save screen real estate, you might have reason not to show that label. And this is where your edit feature in the top right corner comes into play. If you want to edit any of these controls at any time or reposition them at any time, all you have to do is press edit in the top right corner. And now I can go to my control and I can start editing it and I can also start dragging it around. So uh, let's edit it first. Maybe I have reason not to want to see the label underneath the mute button. I need to deactivate my gizmo to be able to slide. So now I'm gonna deactivate the label. If I press done, notice that the label underneath is gone. Using my finger, I can now also resize that mute button by clicking any of the corners and of course can relocate that mute button and with the background picture in place that is very convenient. If I'm happy with my edit, I'm gonna press done. Now I'm basically in operational mode again. And if I press mute, then I mute the entire system. Uh, maybe I want to have a second page, uh, a second page. Maybe on the second page, um, and I will show you how to add a page. Maybe on the second page, I want to have that master volume control. In which case, uh, I'm going to add a fader this time. Let's add a fader rather than a rotary. This is going to be a fader. I'm fine with it showing a label. And now we have to say, what, what kind of control point should this fader control? So let's go to the choose control point type because this fader can control delay or gain. It could also uh, control a parametric EQ or uh, U shaping. So uh, let's do an example of gain and let's say uh, done. Now, again, I have to instruct, is this fader changing input gain or is this fader changing uh, output gain? Well, maybe somebody says, make the music a little bit louder, but keep the, the satellite receiver where it is. Well, then maybe we have reason to make this 
a master fader over input A and B, which is my stereo feed, my music feed. And there is the fader. It maybe doesn't live in the right place, but that is something that we can easily fix with edit. With edit, I can relocate this fader to a more convenient place where it's not living on any of my zones and I'm done. And now I can operate that fader and notice, pay attention to these two input channels. Notice that if I now operate that fader, that I see the music signal, which is my background music, see you go up and down in a uh, level very convenient and hopefully by now you start to get the idea behind the workflow um, of course i can also add a meter if i desire to do so if i want to see the metering of those input channels then i can introduce a meter and i can say okay uh which inputs should the meter show let's have it show a and b and if i press done then there is our meter if i press edit i can put it next to the fader um, which would be somewhat logical. I can put it next to the fader. And now, hopefully, if I operate the fader, okay, the fader is, uh, is uh, post-input metering, but um, I will see the input level of, um, of inputs A and B on that particular 408. But the fader doesn't have to do gain. Maybe I want to give the person that is running this restaurant uh, a very uh, a very um, basic control, let's call it mastery cue, over the tonal balance of his or her entire restaurant. Why don't we make a new page for that? So I go to my gizmo, and I'm going to click in the top of the screen. I'm going to click between the arrows, and that brings up a box. And it says, your custom layout currently contains two pages, but if you want, you can add a third page. So let's add a third page. Let's do add page. And now notice that we're on page three. Page three doesn't have a background picture because I didn't import it yet, um, but you get the idea. So maybe we want to give the um, we want to give the customer um, some basic uh, tonal shaping tools uh, to um, to give some 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 rudimentary control. So why don't we bring up a response curve so that he sees what he's doing? So we're gonna bring up a response curve. I'm fine with the label and um, let's do mastery cue on all four inputs at once, which means that if we keep everything the same, then looking at the response of one input suffices. So here we now have a response curve, which I of course can edit, goes without saying. I can make this a little bit easier to see. I can make this wider, okay? This shows you the input EQ that goes on in input A. And um, I propose that we now make some um, controls to operate the U-shaping. Because, uh, let me zero this out once more. Um, if we go to any of the inputs, we have five band U-shaping, which gives, you know, should provide enough control for a non-audio professional to do something about the tonal balance to his or her liking. So why don't we uh, give the user access to the gain of those bands but not to the corner frequencies or the slopes of those bands just the gains very simplistic a five band eq using u shaping that means that um why don't we use uh wheels to do that which means that we're going to do a wheel and we're going to say the control point type for this wheel is going to be uh shaping eq as in u shaping shaping eq i'm going to say done and now i need to tell the control Okay, which input channels or output channels, uh, which input or output channels should this wheel control? Well, let's do all the inputs because master Q we want to apply at the inputs in this example. So now I'm done, but I also need to specify, okay, which attributes suit the wheel of the input EQ of the U-shaping effect. Should it affect the gain, the frequency, or the slope? I want this to affect the gain. So I'm happy with that. And then I need to say which of the five bands would you like this wheel to affect? Uh, band one, band three, band four, or band five, because you have five bands to play with. I want this to be the lowest and first band. So I'm done, okay? And there's my wheel. I'm gonna use edit and put it underneath edit. I'm gonna put this underneath uh, the chart. 
which I cannot use my gizmo for. So let's put it there. And let's see what happens if we now operate our wheel. If we now operate our wheel, now you see that this wheel controls the lowest band of my U shaping. Okay? That's the only thing that it does. You want more low frequencies, push it up. You want less low frequencies, push it down. And now we can repeat the same process for the other bands. But we can save ourselves time in, in order to do so. Because if I click on any control and keep my finger on the glass in edit mode, then sooner or later a dialog pops up. A dialog pops up, not with my gizmos. Let me de deactivate my gizmos. A dialog pops up that says, would you like to cut the control, copy the control, or delete the control altogether? So I'm pre still pressing the glass, but now I can copy this control. So let's copy this control. And if I now click somewhere else on the screen, I can paste it. And let's paste again. And let's paste again. And let's paste again because we have five bands and we need five controls. So why don't we put those nice next to each other? Okay. And all that's left to do, all that's left to do is assign each of these rotary controls to the associated band of my U shaping. So let's go to this one and it should act on all four inputs, but rather than acting upon band one, this one should act on band two. Done. Let's go to the third one. This should act on band three. Done. Let's go to the fourth one. This should act at band four. Done. And this would be band number five. So that should act on band number five. And there within less than a minute, using the very convenient copy paste feature, I was able to bring up five controls that will affect the input EQ of all four input channels. And I think this is more than enough control for a non-audio professional, even in a restaurant, to affect the voicing of the system to his or his liking. So if we operate the left encoder, this is what controls our low frequencies. The encoder next to it controls the low mids. The controller next to it controls the mid frequencies. Then we get the mid high frequencies. And ultimately, we get the very high frequencies. Okay? Very intuitive. No rocket science. Um, no rocket science. And just to show you that this is happening at all four inputs at once, okay? Rather than showing you a single EQ plot, I'm now going to show you multiple EQs at once. A layout of two columns and two rows. And there we see all input EQs, the U shaping in all four inputs at once. And notice that whatever I do in Compass Go is automatically uh, applied to all of those four inputs. So that would be your master EQ. Huh? And maybe we want to call that page master EQ, in which case we would go to edit. And uh, if we go to edit, uh, sorry, we go to the tool and then we go to the name of this page and we might want to call that you know, master EQ. Okay, and that could be that could be uh, that could be the third page in our restaurant uh, design. Uh, could be the first page in our restaurant design, giving uh, just enough control to make somebody dangerous, but in a very intuitive and straightforward uh, process, and. You know, right now we're doing this with only one Galaxy device, but, you know, I can use the same Compass uh, Go app to do this across multiple Galaxy devices at once. Uh, and you can make it as complicated as you want. Uh, but this is very elegant and, and this is very convenient for people that do not have a major in pro audio, uh, such as people that work in the service industry uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, we're scratching the surface when it comes to custom layouts. Um, all of this can be stored and exchanged between different iPads. You can share these custom layouts through email. But uh, suffice it to say at this point that if you want to know more about custom layouts, then I think that the time has come to direct you to the support video that is available with respect to custom layouts. Because... If you were to visit the Myersound website, then this is the link that will take you to the support video uh, explaining custom layouts 
uh, in more depth, in more detail, uh, showing you all the options that are available. And of course, there on the product page, there's also the uh, 70 page or so user guide uh, explaining you everything that we discussed today and much, much, much more. And hopefully by now you're able to appreciate that the Compass Go app is, uh, is one of those hidden gems. It is, you know, it has a huge amount of functionality that almost rivals the mature Compass version. And that means that I'm, uh, I've come to the end of this Compass Go presentation. I'm more than happy to, uh, to answer any questions at this point. So I see that Ziad had his hand up for some while now. And he's been asking, uh, can we copy the EQ settings? Um, I would not be surprised if we can. Uh, frankly, um, I'm not prepared to answer the question. Um, so I, I'm, I don't know at this point, but I would not be surprised one bit if we can or could. So I get, I get uh, official confirmation that we cannot copy EQ settings. But, you know, if you have Compass Go, then you probably have access to some sort of Galileo device. And if you have access to a Galileo device, then copy and pasting EQ is very straightforward. Okay, in the mature version, let's do some EQ. Let's do some parametric EQ in output six. I'm gonna make a, a, you know, a boost over here. If I want to copy this, out, this EQ, this particular EQ in output six to any of the other outputs, all that I have to do is right click with my mouse anywhere in the dialog and then I can copy all equalization, including U-shaping and more, or I can also just copy exclusively the parametric EQ that we just made. So I'm gonna press copy output parametric EQ, and now I can go to any of my other output channels and right click in the plot and paste the output parametric EQ that I just copied, okay? That is a five second exercise. Um, so it might not be able in, in the Compass Go app, but, um, it's virtual, it's completely in the realm of possibilities. And then I see that James Wilkins rose his hand, go for James Wilkins, uh, please use the chat. A uh, custom layout question, let's say you measure and set your zones so that they all match. They are set at different levels. Can you have a knob on the custom layout? Um, all show zero to be as the nominal setting, even though the actual output to those zones might be different. Uh, not that I'm aware of, because um, the master fader that we show earlier always shows the average values of all offsets in your uh, channels. And this is also true in the mature version of uh, Compass. So not that I'm aware of. Okay, any other questions uh, uh, regarding this presentation at this point? Okay. Well, then I motion, uh, motion uh, to adjourn. Uh, thank you for uh, watching this uh, webinar. A um, Couple of more household notes. Um, as always, this webinar um, within the next couple of hours will be available on our Thinking Sound YouTube channel where you can watch it uh, once more. And uh, later this week on Friday, I'm very happy to announce you that we will have another case study and that is where we will look into the Avicii tribute concert, which took place in uh, Stockholm, uh, Denmark. So uh, that is 344 loudspeakers and 25 Galaxy devices. So if that has your interest, then be sure to join us uh, this Friday, 6 p.m. Central European time, 9 a.m. Pacific time. And then we're going to look at uh, a case study of the Avicii tribute concert at the Friends Arena in Stockholm. Denmark. And all that's left for me to say is uh, thank you for uh, joining us today and please stay safe and healthy and best to you and your loved ones. Bye-bye.